Well, hello. Um, welcome to our um, April webinar. Delighted you could join us. And we've got Luke um, Elston from the University of Reading um, to talk um, about what should you do when you can't do the right thing. I'm sure you've uh, uh, encountered that situation many a time. I know I certainly have. Um, uh, when it feels as though, you know, whichever course of action you take, you're going to um, disappoint somebody or other. So um, delighted to have Luke um, talk to us about that. As usual before, I just want to say a couple of words. Um, these are very strange times and um, we hope that um, everyone and you are keeping all safe and well and your families are well. Um, we recognise um, that, of course, in this environment, we won't be able to hold our um, face to face meetings. So we're moving all our events online. So obviously webinars have always been online, but things like our meetups, which happen um, every um, fourth Tuesday, um, traditionally in the uh, uh, in the Three Guineas pub in Central Reading, they're moving online. So we'll be holding that online. And this month, and Marie will be talking about particularly around stress and anxiety in the current environment. Uh, our partner briefings and other meetings we're moving on online as well. We'll be using um, Zoom. Um, rest assured, it will be in a secure format, so only registered users will be able to uh, join the sessions. And one of the nice things about Zoom is you can have breakout groups and uh, um, rooms where people can discuss in subgroups the topic and then join the main group. So hopefully we'll be able to maintain the interactivity there. Um, we're writing a series of blogs around the current uh, pandemic um, and some of the ethical issues and dilemmas that it uh, um, brings up. And actually, Professor Brad Hooker um, has kicked that off with a blog. Please do um, comment on them. And if you have some other thoughts you would like uh, us to discuss and raise, I'm happy to receive those. Um, one more thing we've done is we've created a community action page on a website. We just want to highlight some of the super stuff that um, organizations are doing uh, around Reading. And we'd love to have um, yeah, you have submissions from you. If you think you know of somebody uh, or a group that are doing um, uh, you know, community um, minded things in this current climate, we'd love to be able to highlight those to our 40, 45 plus organizations who are our partners and uh, our member base, uh, which is around um, two to three thousand now that are following us. One more important thing that we're doing in the current climate, of course, um, people are scared, people are worried, there's a lot of anxiety. Um, we are creating a um, portal um, for um, experts in this space on our website so you can access services, particularly around mental health. So this is as part of our healthy and um, uh, ethical workplace uh, initiative. We'll be creating this um, services portal um, and individuals or organizations can use that. So we hope to do that by the end of this month. So keep an eye out on that. Okie dokie. So just a little bit around ethical reading. Um, we're a not for profit social enterprise um, mission very much to embed ethics in the way we live and work in reading. We want to inspire people through events like this and webinars. Um, we want to provide some level of education and we do believe that working together, we can achieve a lot more. Um, we're around about 44, 45 partners and supporters now and we have approaching 3,000 individual members and followers. Um, but really everything is done by volunteers, even the directors. There's no paid staff. And we hope Reading is the start of something we call the Ethical Cities Movement. So, you know, if you're uh, somewhere else, perhaps in another city and want to do something like this, do get in touch. Um, so here are some of the things we do. Um, we've got these lunchtime webinars. We do meetups. Please go to our website. We've just recently revamped it and uh, it, uh, hopefully um, things are a lot easier to, to identify and get to. Um, we have a code of ethics, and if you're a small, medium organization in particular, you don't have one, um, you're welcome to download it. It's the one we use. Um, and we also have some training developed uh, as well around how to actually create a culture which supports ethics. Um, and we do breakfast seminars for our business uh, organization. Of course, all of these events now will be, as we go forward, online. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Luke. So, Luke, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Gofrit. Um, 
just want to um, say I hope you're all keeping safe and well. And today I'm going to talk about uh, moral dilemmas. Moral dilemmas seem to be cases where, like with moral luck, what I discussed a few weeks ago, seem to be cases where our what you might call our intuitive understanding of morality, what we'd like from morality, seems to break down in particular cases. In particular, you might hope that ethics or morality, tend to use the terms interchangeably, will tell you these are the right things to do, these are the things that's permissible to do, and these are the wrong things to do. These are the things that um, you must not do. So, you know, you can get into all the different details and all the difficult, all the different ethical theories. And there are lots of different awkward, odd cases. But, you know, almost everyone is going to agree that in at least in 99 percent of situations, torture is wrong. Murder is wrong. Um, and giving to charity is almost always fine. <laughs> Feeding your children is almost always fine. And we hope that morality can tell us, even if we disagree on the details, Morality can at any one point say these are the things that are wrong that you must not do. Maybe these are the things that are obligatory that you must do. And then in the middle, there'll be a wide range of things where morality says, eh, do it, don't do it, it's up to you. Moral dilemmas are, if they exist, and it's a big question whether they actually exist, are cases where it seems like you only have wrong options. So morality says, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. But oops, those are the only things you can do. I'll make it less abstract with examples in a moment. Just for moving on, I just want to mention, this is a slightly technical, stipulative sense of the term moral dilemmas. There's a more common use of the term, meaning... um, just a difficult moral situation. Oh, this is a moral dilemma. You know, I'm I'm not sure whether to do this or whether to do this. It's really a tough choice. Um, those are difficult and interesting. But in the sense in which I'm using it today, the term moral dilemma is something much more sort of specific and troubling. And that's what I'll talk about, more than just a difficult decision. Next slide, please. So in particular, a moral dilemma, as some philosophers use the term, is a situation where you have two obligations, two moral obligations, so two um, moral requirements, things you must do. So, for example, you might think that keeping a promise is a moral obligation, and those obligations have not been defeated or cancelled. You know, the, the obligations are still in effect. but You can't comply with both. So whatever you do, you're going to violate one of the obligations. So it's a situation where you can't win whatever you do. Whatever you do, morality seems to tell you, you ought not to have done that. And I'm talking about two undefeated obligations, just to keep things simple. But of course, in many moral dilemmas, there might be more than two. You know, you might have seven different obligations, but you can only comply with one of them. Yeah, and you get to pick which one. But two is enough to get going on with. And like with the discussion of moral luck, the clearest way to get a sense of moral dilemmas is really to look at examples. And of course, because the existence of moral dilemmas is disputed, any particular example is going to be questionable. People are going to be able to question the details. So you end up with this um, sort of situation where people who think there are moral dilemmas say, here's an example of a moral dilemma. And then, the, as we'll see later, the people who reject the existence of moral dilemmas have more sort of general arguments that there can't be any, and they'll try and sort of reinterpret or wriggle out of the examples. Um, so I think the clearest examples involve promises. So I'm going to talk about two examples, one of which involves promising. 
Next slide, please. So here's an example of what I'm going to call conflicting promises. So you live in Reading, you know, ethical Reading. And um, so almost everyone or most of you will know that um, Reading is about a 40 minute drive from Heathrow Airport. And um, the example may not be very relevant in the current situation, but it may well have happened to many of you in the past and hopefully it'll come up again soon. But your friend Sally is coming home from holiday and she's landing at Heathrow Airport. And you, Sally has asked you, can you pick me up from Heathrow when I get in? And because I've got lots of bags, I don't want to have to deal with the bus or the train or a taxi or something, whatever the setup. Maybe it's just more convenient. The point is, you say, yes, of course. Just, you know, send me a WhatsApp message before you take off and I'll come and get you when you land. And you've promised. Sally is is counting on you. She knows she doesn't have to pay for a train or a bus and a taxi or whatever. So she doesn't really have any money left. She's very grateful to you. Separately, your other friend, John, says, hey, can I, who lives in Caversham, so in the northern part of Reading, says, hey, can you watch my uh, five-year-old child on Thursday night? Um, I'd really I like to go out for a drink with my friends. And the child really likes you. And you say, yes, of course. And John makes plans based on your promising to watch his child. And again, this is a promise. If you back out, at least without a really good excuse, if you back out, you will be letting John down and you'll be letting the child down as well because the child is looking forward to it. Unfortunately, you've been a bit negligent. You didn't ask Sally when her flight arrives, and it arrives on Thursday at 8 p.m., right when you would be watching John's child in Caversham. You can't do both. I mean, let's assume you can't do both. You can't both drive to um, Heathrow and watch John's child. You might try and wriggle out of it by um, saying, oh, yeah, I'll watch the child. He can sleep in the car while I drive down the motorway. But let's suppose that's not an option. So the point is, you have two promises that you've made and you can't do both. You're going to have to let John or Sally down. And one um, one feature of moral dilemmas is that whichever one of them you let down Feeling guilty, maybe them blaming you and you offering apologies and recompense all seem entirely appropriate. Whichever one you let down, they would seem to be justified in being quite angry with you. After all, you're breaking a promise and they had made plans based on your promise. So whichever one you let down, um, you you owe them something intuitively. And that makes moral dilemmas seemingly quite different to, for example, cases where you just can't fulfill the promise. So suppose you are on your way to Heathrow and your car breaks down, so you can't go to the airport. Well, in that case, it wouldn't really make much sense in normal circumstances for Sally to be angry with you. It's an unfortunate situation, but it's not really your fault. In this case, it seems a bit different. Whichever one of them you let down, you don't really have an excuse. It's your fault. And this is sort of a classic moral dilemma. Two promises, can't fulfill both. Seems like whichever person you let down, you're, you're doing something morally wrong. You're acting as you ought not. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So the next example uh, is a business one. And the reason I chose this example is to illustrate another way dilemmas can arise with not just two obligations of the same kind. So let's suppose that Helen owns a small business and it's like many small businesses, um, a few major contracts can be a really big deal. A few major contracts can really be the difference between being in profit for the year and making a loss for the year and maybe having to think about laying off staff. 
And she is in contention for a contract in a region where corruption, sort of minor corruption, is common. And she's down to the final three, let's suppose. She's in with a really good chance. She's really competitive at this, let's suppose, I don't know, local government contract or something. But then over drinks with the uh, negotiator on the opposing team, it becomes clear that there will be a, a small bribe will be required to really seal the deal. And not, I mean, in business terms, I'm not imagining a huge bribe. I'm imagining, you know, a few thousand pounds in um, the purchaser's savings account. Something small, but still clearly wrong corruption. And because the region where the purchasing is happening is, this is just a normal way things are done there. Everyone kind of knows what's happening. Certainly her competitors know what's happening. And certainly it seems like her competitors, if they want the business too, they'll have to pay the bribe. And so on the one hand, she's got two choices here. She can refuse to pay the bribe and not get the deal not get the contract. But this is a big contract and it seems like insofar as she runs a small business, she has an obligation to her family who mostly live off the money her business works and her employees perhaps. In a small family firm, many of her employees might even be family members to keep the firm in business. So it seems like on the one hand, she owes something to her um, family and to her firm, maybe, and to her employees and maybe her suppliers to keep the firm in business and making a profit. So if she doesn't pay the bribe, she might, this example is a bit more questionable, but she might be breaching some kind of obligation to them. On the other hand, she has a much more general moral obligation not to be corrupt, not to engage in corrupt practices, both because corruption is in itself wrong and by joining in, she might be entrenching the corrupt practices and may even maybe even spreading them to her region. You know, corruption is will become more pervasive. So um, just as in the previous example, you had two choices, babysit or drive to the airport. Sally, sorry, Helen has two choices pay the bribe, um, violate her obligation not to be corrupt, or don't pay the bribe and perhaps violate her obligation to feed her family. And looks like she can't do both. I mean, you can imagine ways out of the case. It would take a much longer description of the case to make it really ironclad that she can't do both. She can't call the authorities or something. Let's just assume that she really just has these only these two options. And once again, whichever she does, it looks like she owes apology to the party she's let down or, you know, guilt seems appropriate. So um, it's the if she doesn't pay the bribe and her firm actually runs into serious trouble, and her family, you know, struggles. Well, this case maybe isn't so obvious as the previous one, but you could make an argument that she owes maybe not an apology to an employee she's letting go, if they know why. But certainly they ought to feel, certainly she ought to feel very guilty about it and to try and make it up if she can. Um, or certainly if it's her family, for example, that's going hungry. On the other hand, if she does pay the bribe, well, there may not be a particular individual she owes an apology to because the problem of corruption is very diffuse. But you can imagine that, again, she ought to feel very, very guilty about it. And maybe if others found out what she did, she ought they would be justified in holding her to account for it. And we might think she has an obligation to make it up, maybe by... After the fact, this is a bit cheeky, but after the fact, reporting the corruption. 
maybe that's too too much to ask, but certainly something like donating money to an anti-corruption organization or um, vowing never to do business in that region again or vowing never to pay a bribe again. Again, we just have a case where the situation is not simple. She has two different obligations, which seem to be pulling her in two different directions, and they both they both seem to be standing. The obligations remain, and whichever one she complies with, she seems to violate the other. Next slide, please. So um, these examples illustrate a general point about when moral dilemmas seem to arise. Either when you've got multiple conflicting moral principles or multiple moral principles which can conflict in certain circumstances. So in the case we just saw, a moral principle, I mean, this is just a shorthand, but on the one hand, a principle that says keep your firm going, feed your family. And on the other hand, a principle that says don't be corrupt. Um, An example of this that occurred to me uh, last night was if you've seen the Game of Thrones show, Jamie Lannister complains about this, basically. He says, when you become a knight, you have to swear an oath that says, protect the weak, obey the king, and a few other principles. Well, what if the king t- tells you to harm the weak? What are you supposed to do then? He's essentially complaining about these multiple conflicting principles pulling him in different directions. Or maybe this is those are competing promises, as we're about to see. Another uh, way they can arise is if you have one moral principle, but which can have multiple conflicting instances. So the principle is keep your promise or keep your promises. But if you make promises to multiple people, then um, if those two promises conflict, then again, it seems like you have to violate one of them. And so the only moral theories that seem to give rise to moral dilemmas would seem to be the would seem to be moral theories that have either of these two features, you know, sort of multiple conflicting principles or principles where instances of them to conflict can conflict. Excuse me. But if you think about standard utilitarianism, utilitarianism, sort of the simplest version, which just says always act so as to maximize long run happiness or something like that. It won't give rise to dilemmas because there will always be one act which, if you do it, will give rise to the highest long run happiness. And that's what you ought to do. So in the cases, it will turn out, in fact, that you'll either cause more unhappiness by letting down the airport pickup or by letting down the babysitting. And so whichever one of those would cause less pain, that's the one you should do. So there's no dilemma there. Now, of course, it may be that in some rare cases, actions will be precisely tied for which one will produce the greatest long run happiness. But in that case, most versions of utilitarianism will say you you can choose freely. If there's tied for best, choose any. The point is that utilitarianism would seem not to lead to dilemmas, just because it has one single principle. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so unless you're a utilitarian or something like that, whether or not you find the examples I've given convincing, you you might think, well, okay, what's wrong with moral dilemmas? There seem to be reasonably clear cases of them. What's the problem? But as with moral luck, there are some very general arguments against the possibility of moral dilemmas. And so that push people to want to explain away the possibility. The first, I'll talk about two of these. The first is what's sometimes called the action guidingness of morality. You might think, well, morality is there to tell us what to do. And there's a certain kind of fairness in play that it should be possible to comply under our own steam with um, what morality required of us. This is our goal. This is what we want morality for. But moral dilemmas seem to be a case where it's not action guiding. There's no way of doing what morality requires. 
And similarly, we might um, we might worry about legal dilemmas. If the legal system puts people in a situation where whatever you do, you act wrongly, you might well regard that as a problem. Um, you might think any legal system that says um, you're in this situation, the two laws require opposing things of you, Nothing, whichever way you act, you act illegally. That's a problem, and the legal system should be, you know, if possible, tweaked to avoid that intuitively. Similarly, you might worry about it in the case of the um, of morality. And secondly, this is a slightly more um, technical worry, but they seem to lead to conflicting verdicts about single actions. So, for example, um, take the case of Helen and whether she ought to pay the bribe. Well, the anti-corruption principle tells us she ought not to pay the bribe. But the pro-feeding your family principle tells us she ought to feed her family. But then if you ought to do something, then you ought to take whatever means are necessary to doing that thing. So it seems to tell us she ought to pay the bribe. So we end up with morality saying she both ought on the one hand and ought not to pay the bribe. Or in the other terms I've been using, uh, she is obligated to pay the bribe and she is obligated not to pay the bribe. And similarly, you are obligated to drive to Heathrow. You are also obligated not to drive to Heathrow because you have an obligation to do something else instead. And for slightly more technical reasons in what's called deontic logic, people worry about this. They worry that morality should just give a single verdict about whether a particular action is morally permissible or not. And in these cases, you end up with it giving multiple opposing verdicts. So those are sort of the very general problems that people have with moral dilemmas. Next slide, please. OK, just to conclude, um, over the past two, this uh, webinar and the previous one, I've talked about ways in which morality might be more complex than we thought it was. Morality seems not to play fair. In moral luck, it seems like, well, you can act wrongly or you can act rightly, but it's not always up to you in a certain sense, whether you acted wrongly or rightly. It depends on luck. It depends on factors outside your control. And in moral dilemmas, it seems like you can't even always act rightly. There may well be cases where, um, hey, sorry, turns out whatever you do, um, you're going to act wrongly. And these both challenge the idea of a moral system, which to use a term I just used is action guiding that provides clear instructions that we can always follow. And in some sense, it's up to us whether we can follow them. The one that doesn't require impossible things of us. So moral luck and moral dilemmas both threaten a sort of hopeful, perhaps fair play vision of what morality, in fact, requires of us. Next slide, please. Finally, I just wanted to mention uh, some suggested reading. I wouldn't normally suggest a book, but um, Walter Sinnott Armstrong's book from the late 80s called Moral Dilemmas is rigorous, and he's an extremely clear writer. It's an entire book devoted to moral dilemmas. So if you can get hold of the copy and you, if you found the topic interesting, you know, and you've got some time, if um, um, you've got some uh, lockdown time, I, I do recommend it, actually. I happened across it randomly in a university library, and that's what got me interested in moral dilemmas in the first place. But secondly, in case you're not familiar with it, there's a website called the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and it's extremely good. In general, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is an extremely rigorous and detailed and clear place to look for introductions or discussion of any philosophical topic, including in ethics. Now, it is aimed at 
at least people who are towards the end of an undergraduate degree in philosophy. So perhaps some parts of it get a bit technical or a bit hard to follow, but especially the introductory parts of each entry are extremely useful and clear and rigorous. And SCP, as it's called, Stanford Encyclopedia Entry of Philosophy Entries, are all written by, or almost all written by, professional philosophers who have published in that area. So the entry on moral dilemmas has been written by an expert on moral dilemmas. So I, I and it's free. I should mention, of course, it's free. Uh, so I do recommend that. Either way, um, that's it. And thanks very much. And thank you, GoPrint, for the opportunity. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much, Luke. Uh, excellent, uh, 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 as always. And um, uh, I just want to echo, actually, the um, point about the Stanford uh, site. Um, it is incredibly comprehensive, incredibly comprehensive, incredibly detailed. I've used it a few times and, and it's great because you could just go in and do a search and find a topic that you're interested in and uh, read to your heart's content. So that's um, it's, it's really an excellent site. Um, and thank you very much for that. And if you would like to, as with um, a number of these sessions, you want to replay them at your leisure, uh, you can do so on our YouTube channel. Um, so the link is there on that on that um, slide there. Uh, and if you enjoyed the session, uh, please do subscribe um, and uh, you'll be notified as new webinars are uploaded. Uh, we'll make these um, slides available on our website in due course as well. Um, do check our website for upcoming events as well. Um, as I said, we're moving everything online, so they're still available. And we'd love for you to follow us uh, through our various um, social media sites, whichever one is is your favorite. Uh, and thank you for joining us today. And we hope to see you soon. Take care. All the best.